For those of you who don't know, I'm Ryan Sickles, Assistant Director of Media Relations at CSIS. Work with Andrew on behalf of Andrew. Welcome. Happy Easter and Passover. Um, I have three, three experts here to brief on the briefing. I know some of you have to get to the White House, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'll introduce uh, Dan again when he gets here. Um, to my right, Meredith Broadman is our senior advisor and Shoal chair in international business. Uh, she was the former assistant U.S. trade rep for industry, market access, and telecom. And Steve Johnson is the director of our Americas program, former deputy assistant secretary of defense for Western Hemisphere Affairs. Um, Meredith's going to start off, give us a little um, what's happening or not happening as far as the trade front in the, uh, at the summit. Steve's going to give us a little history of the summit itself and some of the regional implications and security implications, et cetera. Um, and I think all of them will be happy to take any questions on the Rousseff visit in the Q&A section, but I don't know that, that that's necessarily going to come up in the uh, opening remarks. So Meredith, I'll let you get us started. I'll be pretty brief. Um, unlike in years past when ch trade has been a big headline issue in a summit like this where we've got, you know, a lot of bilateral relationships that are bumping up against our shores and, and concerns about um, how sort of economic integration proceeds in the hemisphere, um, this year, this year uh, I don't see trade at this point figuring very, very high on, on any headlines that might come out of the meeting. Uh, back in the 1990s, you know, we had um, the Summit of the Americas, which launched the uh, the goal of the Free Trade Agreement of the Americas, which really envisioned uh, hemispheric economic integration, sort of a free trade agreement that would would knit NAFTA with Mercosur and the uh, the, the the trade groups that were were growing in the region. Um, that, of course, has has um, not really panned out as as the the thought was to begin with, and and trade relations has really kind of taken a different turn in the hemisphere. I think recently, uh, the biggest development has been uh, the declaration of the impasse in the in the Doha round in Geneva. That was that's the multilateral trade negotiation where the U.S. negotiates negotiates with all of Latin American countries, all of Europe, all of uh, the rest of the world, and most of our trade relations with the region, particularly with the big economies like Brazil and Argentina, were being really addressed in that forum. They were part of the BRIC groups, part of the advanced developing countries uh, on tariff cutting formulas. They um, you know, they had their own set of, of uh, uh, potential uh, reduction mechanisms that might apply to them. Um, because of the impasse that was declared in the, Euro in the uh, Doha round, I think this is kind of a rebuilding year. We're all looking at the region to see, see where we go next on broadening trade and economic ties. Um, trade, of course, by the private sector and just the demographics of the region between the big countries and the United States is growing very fast. You see exports to Brazil growing at 25 percent a year. Uh, you know, we have 40, $43 billion of exports there now. Um, but this is really growing, growing outside the context of what governments are doing um, and just the general uh, energy of the private sector in both places to, to continue to grow. Um, and I think Brazil, as the United States, is recalibrating trade policy. Where do they go now that most of their eggs are not in the WTO basket? Is there something that we could do in the region that would, that would open things up a bit? Brazil, of course, is uh, the, the keystone of, of the Mercosur Agreement and really values those relationships. Um, and I think there's a lot of leaders, particularly in Congress, that would someday like to see a bridge between NAFTA and the, Euro the Mercosur Agreement, but, but that's a really long way off. And um, I think right now we're just taking stock about where countries go after, after the end of the Doha round. Um, you saw uh, uh, last week, and uh, Steve Johnson and I did just a quick critical questions on this, on, on a trade sanction that was taken against Argentina, which is probably one of our, one of our more antagonistic trade relations that we have in the region. Um, the, uh, because of uh, activities, I think, in not respecting arbitral awards on U.S. investments, um, the U.S. decided 
um, interagency to actually make Argentina no longer uh, eligible for trade preferences under the generalized system of preferences. And that's a pretty, pretty unusual act in the sense that countries have not been completely excluded from GSP for, for many, many years. You haven't seen a whole country just being removed from this, this preference program. And I think it's been 10 or 11 years. And those countries tend to be pretty bad actors. So I think it's, it's a reflection that there is a lot of friction in, in trade relations with some of these countries. Argentina has a, a very different philosophy on how to develop its economy. It is uh, really throwing up some huge barriers to US, US exports to, to Argentina right now that um, are hurting US companies. And I think when the companies raise these problems and the Argentine government uh, takes measures to, to make the companies feel even more uncomfortable in Argentina. So things aren't really smooth in the bilateral relationships with some of the major economies right now. I think on the plus side, Colombia, um, of course, just, just uh, We've had the success of getting Congress to finally implement the free trade agreement, and that was just a real success. Got that off the table, and now I think as Colombia works its way through the implementation process, they've got to do um, get their labor, some of their labor laws updated and so forth. But I think that's on track, and, and within the year, Colombia will have that free trade agreement implemented. And then can, we can look forward with this really strong trading partner to see where do we go in the future. And, and there are many that would hope that Colombia would want to request to be a member of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Negotiation, for example. Um, and uh, that would be uh, kind of a next stage of, of taking that trade relationship to, to another level. Um, and Colombia, of course, is hosting a big CEO summit, I, as I understand it. Um, so the U.S. business groups will probably have some good, good things to say about what they see in the future. I know co uh, companies like Walmart and so forth are sending representatives down there to, to talk about what they're seeing in the future and the trends uh, that they see coming. So, so far, I don't see huge trade headlines coming out of this. It's a rebuilding time in the wake of, of the impasse in the Doha round. But trade continues to grow and expand based on the demographics and the energy of the private sector. And um, would appreciate any sort of uh, reflections you all had on what you see. Thank you. Great. And I think the CEO summit leads well to our next briefer, Dan Rundy. He's our Schreier Chair, Director in Project and Prosperity and Development at CSIS, as well as the co-director of our U.S. Leadership and Development. So looks a lot at public-private partnerships, et cetera, and has spent quite a lot of time in and out of Brazil. So keep that in mind for the Q&A. Thanks, Dan. Thanks very much. Uh, I would say that from a development standpoint, uh, that this has been the best 10 years in Latin America in the last two centuries. So from a development standpoint, this is a, a moment where uh, there's been actually a number of positive things that have happened in the region. I think if you look at Colombia, I think Colombia's country brand uh, hasn't fully caught up with the, re the good news story that is Colombia. You've had uh, several years now of year-on-year -year growth. Um, they've put the, uh, they've got the FARC on the ropes. So when people think about Colombia, you tell people you're going to Colombia, people still say, oh, uh, you know, really, actually, Colombia is a really great place to be, and it's really a great, it's a great news story in the region. And so I think one of the things to be looking at is, is how much progress they've made over the last 10 years in, in combating uh, terrorism and combating uh, the, uh, the FARC and, and paramilitaries. And that's been a bipartisan project between Republicans and Democrats over the, really the last 15 years, Clinton administration, Bush administration, Obama administration. So I think that's, a, that's one of the good news stories to watch. I do think, though, that the administration, I'm sure Steve will, will make reference to it, I do think that uh, the Obama administration has some serious fence mending to make with the Colombians. They have been our best ally in the region. And I think there's been, I, I think it's been um, almost shameful the way in which the administration has treated the Colombians, uh, given the fact that it took three long years to get this uh, Colombian trade deal done. I think it's uh, really unfortunate. Uh, to have such a great ally in the region and to take that long to get a trade deal done. And that's related to development. It's about signaling about what kind of a commitment that we have uh, to that country. So I think it's uh, been very awkward. And I'm sure Steve will tell you that uh, they've looked around for other friends, uh, given the fact that we've, uh, we sure took our sweet time to do it. And that, that's been unfortunate. So I'm looking forward to seeing the administration uh, mend fences here, uh, and so this will be a nice opportunity to do that. And as I said, it's a, it's a good news story. Um, rest of the region, again, uh, like I said, best 10 years perhaps in the last two centuries. 
Brazil has reduced its poverty. The, at, the absolute number of poor people in Brazil has been reduced, I think, in the last 10 years by 30 million people. Think about that. I mean, it's a country of 150 million people. They made tremendous economic progress. A uh, number of other countries as well. So there's a lot of good news in the region from a development standpoint. Some of it, a lot of it driven, frankly, by trade agreements. And so it's linked to trade. And so I think it's great that um, there's been some interest in by the administration on, on TPP. But I think that uh, there's the need for U.S. leadership on uh, hemispheric trade, and I think this is something that we should be pushing and we should be more aggressive about because it's about prosperity, it's about poverty alleviation, and to the extent that we have not been aggressive about this, this administration, I think that it, it has impacts on poverty in, in the region. Um, so that's on the, on the good news side. Let me just make reference to the Inter-American Development Bank on two points about the Inter-American Development Bank. The United States uh, led it, or, or basically came along, around to the idea of supporting a general capital increase for the Inter-American Development Bank. This is, in essence, sort of providing them with more money to make loans uh, in the region. They're, they're a big player in Haiti. Uh, they're a big player in terms of infrastructure. And they're a uh, thought leader in terms of social infrastructure in the region. So they are. They are in a very good place in terms of as a development leader. The president of the Inter-American Development Bank is Colombian and is very close to President Santos. And so is going to, they're going to do their best to support the uh, summit to be as, as good a success as you can, can hope for, given the context. Um, the second point is that, as Meredith mentioned, there's going to be a CEO summit. It's the first time there's a parallel CEO summit with, it, with one of these Summit of the Americas. I don't expect huge announceables coming out of this, but I do think it's a very good innovation uh, that they are going to be doing this on an ongoing basis. And I think the, I think it's great that the IDB is convening it. I'm not sure the IDB is is completely equipped to to build all the partnerships that that uh, that could come out of this. But I think that um, you know we ought to be seeing organizations like Canadian CEDA or USAID or the Inter American Foundation or other or philanthropies tied to the region. Uh, as potential partners to this. And I know they'll convene a number of folks, but I think, so I think the IDB has the convening power, but may not have all the instruments to actually actualize all the opportunities. And so bringing some of these other actors to the table, whether it's aid or Canadian CETA, is, is a good thing. And, and or even organizations like ABC, which is the Brazilian aid agency, uh, which has a 30 or $40 million technical assistance budget. Um, let me just, uh, so that's on the positive side. Uh, there continue to be challenges in the region. Uh, obviously, there continues to be great inequality in the region. Uh, there continues to be uh, deficits on infrastructure. Uh, there continues to be transnational challenges around gangs, which is something of, of interest to the administration and is a, a challenge, especially in Central America, uh, as well as um, the, uh, the challenges for democratic governments to deliver public goods and to be uh, that you have, uh, there's been a, an uptick in support of democracy in the region in the last five or six years, partially reflecting the fact that there's been increased prosperity, and so people associate the current governments with prosperity. There were several years ago, about six or seven years ago, there was a, a real low point in supporting democracy in the region. That's ticked up over the last five or six years. But I do think that it does mean that there is still continues to be a challenge around governance, uh, around support, uh, supporting uh, activities to, to fight corruption because to the extent that you have corruption or, or you have poor governance, you poison the well on sort of the democratic project, you poison the well on the sorts of reforms that oftentimes you need to, to see uh, further prosperity happen in a society. Um, and then finally, let me just make one uh, reference to Argentina. I think uh, there, I think it's going to become harder and harder for Argentina to remain a member of the G20 with this sort of behavior. So I think they're probably too polite to say so uh, in in uh, in open in open uh, state. But I think a good replacement for Argentina from a Latin America standpoint would be Colombia. So watch that space. I think that uh, as con Argentina can be a bit bad actor in the international system. Uh, that they may have their uh, license to participate as a, as a uh, constructive middle-income country taken away from them. I'll stop there. Thanks, Sam. Steve, you want to back clean up? Um, my take on the Summit of the Americas is that uh, it contrasts greatly with uh, a couple of uh, meetings that we've just had or uh, a meeting that is uh, ongoing today. Um, and 
what it really is is kind of a, a difference between uh, a group of a large group of uh, nations that comes to, together to discuss uh, topics, and then a small group of nations, uh, three in uh, the case of the North American Leaders Summit, in which you have a rather harmonious discussion of things that uh, three countries uh, uh, more or less agree on. Uh, this is uh, 33 countries, including the, uh, in addition to the United States, that will be coming together at the uh, Americas Summit. And uh, as a result of that, because there are so many differences between these countries, it's uh, naturally going to be a little more contentious than um, uh, a summit in where you have uh, partners that are pretty much committed to certain ideals. So that may be the, the big news story coming out of this, uh, uh, this uh, upcoming meeting on April 14th and 15th. I think expectations should be tempered uh, by a low common denominator of agreement on projects, small likelihood that most of the commitments will actually be fulfilled, and the possibility that intermissions on Cuba, drug legalization, mm -hmm. and uh, Argentina's Falklands, uh, Falklands uh, Malvinas uh, claims will be brought up. Uh, from a U.S. perspective, the Obama administration facing shrinking foreign operations budget will have uh, very little to offer, so while the summit may be useful, its impact may be limited. Now, there's certain themes that will be brought up, but they're not easy to find, and it, uh, um, they've only come together uh, rather recently. I also should note that um, it's taken uh, pretty much uh, the span of uh, four years since the last summit to put uh, all of this together, and the country of Colombia should be congratulated uh, for being able to, to do this. In consultation with other countries, um, it's come up with the following sub-themes. Reduction of part, uh, poverty and inequality, uh, as both uh, uh, Dan and, and Meredith mentioned, uh, uh, this has been a very good decade for Latin America. Uh, growth on average has been 4 to 5 percent, and uh, most of the countries in the region have not suffered as the United States did during the recession of 2008 and 2009. That said, um, many countries, especially in South America, the Andean region, and, and Central America, um, still have poverty rates that are in the neighborhood of 25 to, to 30 percent, some as high as, as uh, 50 percent. Uh, to 60 percent, and then there's there's Haiti as well. So that's still a problem, and then there's the inequality, uh, the difference between the, the rich and the poor, and uh, again, uh, there's a lot of work that uh, needs to be done. Noting, however, that uh, Latin America has come a long way. Natural disasters, um, as uh, populations grow larger, demographic argue, demographics argues that uh, natural disasters are going to affect more and more people. So this is an important mm -hmm. subject for people to, to discuss uh, at, at these summits. And how do you coordinate assistance? Because um, in the past, it hasn't gone very well. Haiti's kind of a showcase where it did. Uh, but uh, there was, uh, that was fairly close to US shores, and we had an opportunity to, to make a, a fairly rapid and, and immediate impact. But other. Uh, earthquakes, uh, volcano eruptions, and, and perhaps some uh, hurricane incidents in the Eastern Caribbean may not uh, afford that opportunity. So the, uh, to the extent that it's possible for the United States and other nations to agree on a fairly easy topic to agree on, we can improve uh, coordination on natural disasters. Access and use of technologies is another sub-theme, and uh, it to, remains to be seen whether Latin America can pull ahead of other regions and uh, developing regions in the world in terms of its uh, penetration for the use of broadband, internet, and uh, uh, computers. Citizen security and transnational crime, Dan brought this up. Um, it uh, is kind of a sad fact that the 32 most violent cities in the world are actually in the Americas. So there's some work to be done there. And drug trafficking, which is about a $400 billion a year industry, is something that uh, impacts this hemis hemisphere inordinately. There will be talk about regional integration, physical integration, highways, railroads, uh, uh, pipelines, things of this nature, energy networks. Uh, the energy grid uh, 
in Latin America is about sufficient to take care of the current population the way it is, but that population is uh, 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 thought to, to grow, it may, may be growing by about uh, 200 million people uh, in the next uh, 12 to, to 15 years. Um, the current grid is not going to be able to handle that, so there's uh, some work that needs to be done on that, and also to make it more resilient, it has to be more connected. Supportive cooperation. Um, this is really in sort of Dan's field, but uh, um, something that will be brought up this year that could be useful is um, north-south cooperation, mm. south-south cooperation, where countries in sub-regions should be able to coordinate and work to uh, help themselves on development issues. And then the issue of trying to get NGOs to be less as uh, small governments unto themselves and coordinated uh, players uh, in countries uh, of need. Now again, what's not going to be on the agenda, uh, but is probably going to be uh, brought up and, and be uh, something that's likely to make news, the issue of Cuba. It's important to understand that uh, Cuba is not a democracy, and, and so uh, until it is, it's uh, not welcome in the, uh, 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 this forum. Notwithstanding um, what uh, individual leaders may say, it's uh, something that the states themselves have to agree on, and the two crown jewels of the Organization of American States that organizes the summit uh, are democracy and human, human rights. So for those that have said this should be the last uh, summit without Cuba, uh, of course that's true, it, it should be the last, but uh, Cuba has some work to do to uh, continue the reforms that have been started under Raul and to uh, become a member in, in good standing of the OAS. Um, bottom line, given the need for consensus, uh, one might ask whether such summits are a waste of time for countries, uh, uh, resources, and, and leaders' uh, time. Uh, so far, the Summit of the Americas process can be said to have kind of an uneven uh, record. However, it ha can be credited with a number of things, that positive things that have managed to come out of it, like the Inter-American Democratic uh, Charter in, in 2001. Uh, aid uh, contributions uh, uh, to Haiti, uh, contributions in, in public health uh, for AIDS programs. Uh, these are notable achievements for the summits. The other thing, though, that's worth mentioning, and I'll quit with this, is that the summits offer a unique forum for dialogue and mutual understanding for regional leaders. And more, most importantly, they provide one location where a broad gathering of leaders can engage in private, bilateral, and honest discussions on truly divisive issues, in pull-asides, in separate meetings, private meetings between leaders. And that is truly the summit of the America's greatest value, because you can't get so many people together and have truly uh, uh, substantive talks uh, at uh, one place unless you have something that organizes them all to get into that place and affords an opportunity to sit together off to the side and talk about things that really matter. Thank you. Great. So we'll take some questions, but just a reminder, we're uh, transcribing and the audio and video will be available later, so please use the microphone as you ask your question. Yeah, we'll start here. Thank you very much. Uh, Vladimir Karamorza with RTVI. I have a, a couple of quick questions for Mr. Johnson. They actually both follow offs of what you of what you mentioned. First on Cuba, um, there was a threat of the of the boycott earlier. I think, if I'm correct, it's just the president of Ecuador in the end who's not coming. Um, how significant do you think that that fact is that he's not there? And do you expect this pressure to continue to grow um, for for Cuba in its current totalitarian state to be present? And, in fact, if you could just explain how is that going to work, for instance, does the U.S. have a veto if, if the majority of other nations would like to invite communist Cuba there? And, and secondly, on the, on the Falkland Islands, you said that Argentina is likely to raise that question. Is this just going to be a symbolic move or is it going to be a, some kind of a meaningful discussion on the, on the Falklands there 30 years after the, after the war? Thank you. Vladimir, on, on, on Cuba, uh, the important thing is that uh, Cuba uh, begins to make progress to uh, uh, become eligible to, to join this forum and also to uh, participate as a full member of the OAS. Um, there's a great deal of pressure to, to bring Cuba in. Uh, the, 
the thing that stands in contrast to that would be the, the Democratic Charter and also the organizing charter of the, the Organization of American States. Um, so the ball is actually in, in Cuba's court to, to be able to do that. Um, nonetheless, uh, that's not a message that the United States can easily take to the, the Cuban leadership, but it's incumbent on Latin America's leadership that uh, has uh, uh, relations with uh, Cuba to be encouraging to Raul to go farther than just some of the economic reforms that have uh, uh, begun to transform the economy there to include uh, a uh, uh, move to open up the political system to competitive elections and and to true citizen participation where people aren't uh, asked to rubber stamp or approve uh, uh, in, in the Cuban Congress uh, uh, laws uh, and uh, initiatives that uh, are proposed by the leadership, but that uh, truly initiatives can be developed at the grassroots and, and uh, brought up through this, the system. Cuba has a great deal of native talent, and uh, uh, that talent should be allowed to have a voice. Um, and it deserves, I mean, it, it does, it's not a question of allowing, it, it uh, deserves a, uh, a voice. On the Falkland Islands, uh, Malvinas uh, question, um, that's something that is probably largely symbolic, uh, but uh, Argentina outside of the summit process has al already tried to uh, encourage uh, some of its neighbors in South America to uh, um, um, boycott or ban flights or shipping to uh, the islands um, until there's a, a resolution that uh, favors Argentina. So it's moving already on the diplomatic front and uh, uh, reasserting its, its claim. It was disastrous the last time that it, uh, it took this into a, uh, a military uh, attempt at a solution. Um, I don't think Argentina is going to go that far, but it's certainly going to be a, an important topic of conversation. Yeah, Roger. Uh, thank you, Roger Runnigan of Bloomberg News. Um, a question for all three of you. Um, describe for us what you think the state of relations is with between the U.S. and South America right now compared to, say, five years ago. And second, um, for all three of you, the president goes down there uh, mindful of the elections. So what things coming up here are going to limit him because of the elections. Who wants to lead off? I'm looking to Steve. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me uh, stick my little toe into those uh, waters. Um, state of uh, U.S. South American relations compared to, to five years ago. I think uh, President Obama enjoys a great deal of popular approval uh, personally in Latin America and uh, the Caribbean and, and, and certainly uh, uh, continues uh, um, to have, uh, as a U.S. leader, a substantial amount of approval in, in Canada as well. Um, and that uh, really holds him and in, in puts him in a very good position. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that uh, uh, given the economic situation and also the uh, tendency of this administration to look to the Middle East as its main area of engagement, and then recently uh, state that it is turning to the uh, Pacific Rim and Asia uh, to uh, um, um, plus up its, its uh, relations and also its military involvement, uh, makes it seem as if it doesn't have a focus uh, for the Americas. And that's something that's been noted by some of the, the leaders. Um, the administration doesn't have the luxury of being able to, to go to this summit uh, as some previous ones had uh, from the very beginning up until 2005 with a grand idea such as the free trade area of the Americas. Um, unfortunately, that's that's not there. So, so some other things which uh, have to do with uh, um, specific areas, and Dan can get into this, that have to do with development, um, the United States can take those. Uh, it can talk about some of the work that it's been done on citizen security. But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, uh, 
uh, the United States is not as much of an aid player as it was in the past uh, for a number of factors that, uh, that Dan can, can talk about. And the other thing is on trade is that uh, the FTAA is actually um, moving along in, in piecemeal fashion. It's not a, a grand bargain. It's not a grand strategy, but uh, it is moving forward, and, and Meredith can kind of uh, discuss how that's, that's happening now. So the United States is, is, uh, is moving forward, and relations, uh, uh, I think, are, are getting better, but not in a way that uh, um, makes the United States the, the center of attention like it would have been um, five or six, seven or eight, nine, ten, ten years ago. It's more of an equal partner. Uh, it uh, certainly has a, a great deal of weight and great deal of influence and probably always will. But it's uh, not going to be necessarily the, the most uh, uh, preeminent um, actor on the stage at uh, any one time. In terms of uh, the limits of the elections, um, the president's got limited amount of time that he can spend on foreign affairs except for very big issues. And so it's not likely that uh, uh, the Americas will figure greatly in that, although in the, the upcoming campaign, certainly um, his ideas uh, for um, a policy toward the Americas, toward the hemisphere and, and toward Latin America may figure, and the degree to which uh, uh, the Americas is an important uh, um, um, part of the world uh, for this White House, and for any White House, uh, uh, for all the candidates. Um, it's one that matters to us a great deal because of family relationships, geographic connectivity, uh, and growing amount of trade. Latin America itself is uh, our number four trade partner. Mexico's number three, Canada's number one. So the Americas, in economic terms, still count. Yeah. Okay. Um, on the development side, the Inter-American Development Bank uh, lends out about $12 billion a year in resources, and we have a grant, the U.S. government has about a $1.5 billion a year uh, assistance program in the Americas. There's, there's other, other pieces to it, but that's sort of a, a pretty, in, that's, a, that's a zip, those are two zip code uh, numbers for you to think about. I think we, I think from 10 years ago, I th again, I go back to there's been a lot of progress made. So I do think there are a number of countries where we continue to provide, um, we have a small assistance program in Brazil, which I find, frankly, very strange. We're in some ways fighting the last war in development in a place like Brazil that now has its own foreign assistance program, has a space satellite program, is has a sovereign wealth fund, is a G20 member. I think we... Are, I think there's an opportunity for the administration, and I think they've begun to gra you know, have been grappling with this. I think and, and, and doing as best they can. So I think it's uh, it's something that's going to evolve over time. But how we rethink the sorts of cooperation approach that we have with what are called middle income countries, countries like a Brazil or a Mexico or a Colombia, uh, I can imagine a time over the next five years where we don't have an assistance program in Colombia. That we that it does so well in beating the FARC, and that it that it's, it's is in a place where we don't need to be there anymore. And I think that's coming. So we certainly don't need to have an assistance program in in Brazil. And that, but it's uh, and if, but I do think we have to think about how we reset our relations with these middle income countries in ways that uh, create uh, exchanges or leverage our expertise have small amounts of catalytic funding, perhaps in the form of a bilateral foundation, something that looks like, if people are familiar with the German Marshall Fund, which is an endowed foundation that sort of encapsulates or holds our relationship between uh, the transatlantic, uh, the Western Europe and the United States. I think we need to be thinking about something like that for our relationship with Brazil and perhaps for a number of other uh, countries in the region. We have something like this in Costa Rica, a small version of this in Costa Rica that when we exited from a, from an assistance standpoint. So I think um, we, I do think there's a sense of don't forget us. There's a little bit of that sense within the, uh, within the region, I think as Steve was saying. Uh, but I think because of this changing economy and the changing dynamics of the society that perhaps the instruments that we have, we may be offering chicken or beef and they may not want chicken or beef, they may want uh, something different than chicken or beef in terms of what we can offer them in terms of cooperation, in terms of our relationships. 
Um, let me just say on the U.S. elections, I do think that um, it's going to be, uh, you know, things that would be good for development like a more aggressive trade regime. I don't think the administration is going to be pushing because I don't think it's, uh, I, I, unfortunately, it's uh, something that I think would be great for the region and great for development. But we're not going to, I don't think we're going to see additional political capital given the reluctance the administration's had on pushing trade agreements. It sort of had to be grit driven, kicking and screaming. I think, unfortunately. Um, I also think uh, uh, discussions about broader hemispheric energy security uh, and energy progress, I think, are sort of marred by uh, the unfortunate uh, uh, state of affairs with our neighbor to the north. And, uh, and they've already talked about saying we'll find, uh, they'll find markets elsewhere. So I do think that uh, it does impact our, if we want to say we're going to have energy cooperation with countries <laughs> like Brazil or, or Mexico, and to the extent that we're, we're playing um, games with with our one of our best allies to the north i think that doesn't that's not particularly helpful and i think that's i think also politically driven um yeah i think i remember what your question was on to state of what's the uh relation what's the, how's the relation different from five years ago and yeah what's holding back the election um I guess I see the the two most important trading partners in the region, Brazil and the United States, are kind of stuck in our, our bilateral relationship as far as the government's concerned and what future objectives are. Um, and I think, as I mentioned, it's a result of, of some of the problems in the Doha round. Um, I think we need to figure out what this is for the future. Um, Right now, I don't think Brazil has, has strong aspirations to want to build its trade relationship with the United States. Um, and that, in some ways, is really curious because w as two countries, we have very uh, similar uh, success in the international marketplace. We're both huge exporters and depend on an international trading system that works and, and protects our, um, our, our exports and makes sure that there's fair treatment. Um, but for whatever reason, we were not able to come to agreement in the WTO and now are both kind of spinning off doing our own agendas. And I think right now, as the U.S. defines it, it's the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations, which is basically focused on grabbing a lot of the economic growth that's happening in Asia, and then potentially in the future, if the administration wants to take it there, bringing kind of like-minded countries into that platform. And, and we have not gotten there yet, but I think a lot of people will hope that that, that will be a successful platform on, on, on to which to build our next kind of uh, trade trade liberalizing organization. Um, but that still leaves the question of where where's the future for Brazil and the United States? And you see in the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations, both Canada and Mexico very interested in joining. And this is this is kind of a subtext in the ten, in the sense that both leaders have come to the United States to the President Obama and said, "We really want to be involved." And the President's going to have to make some decision and and some message to them about what their future is. What's the entrance ramp into this negotiation if he sees one for them? Um, and I think that's sort of a first hurdle, you know, that they're our like-minded trading partner from NAFTA, uh, our longest um, free trade agreement relationship. So if, if, if we can't kind of ne get to the next level with them, I don't think we, we will with Brazil anytime soon. But uh, Brazil has its own strategy in the region focused mm -hmm. on Mercosur. Um, not a lot of talk about bridging between NAFTA and Mercosur. Um, at this point, and then countries like Colombia, Peru, that are kind of in the middle, that are probably in the like-minded camp, are having to make their choices on what their future trade relationships look like. So it's a really interesting time as people try to, to recalibrate and figure out what they want to do for the next eight or ten years on trade. Yeah, right here. Karen Bohan of Reuters. Stephen, I just wanted to follow up on Roger's question. When Okay. Um, in terms of the effort the administration's made to engage with the hemisphere, the president did say at the beginning of his administration that, that he wanted to deepen ties there. How do you think he's done overall in terms of fulfilling that promise? And um, to what extent do you think the distractions of the Middle East have, have hampered him? Um, and has he been able to form um, a personal rapport with any of the leaders in the region in particular? Karen, that's a good question. You know, you look back in, in history and you see uh, presidents like uh, President Reagan, President Clinton, and, and even 
George W. Bush that had uh, surrogates that uh, could uh, work uh, even when they didn't have time to, to be able to meet uh, with different uh, leaders and, and, and make trips uh, to the region. And uh, certainly they did, and, and certainly this president has tried to, to make time to, uh, uh, to visit the region and, and is doing so now and has actually had a very busy month with uh, his North American Leaders Summit, uh, his uh, the state uh, visit with uh, uh, Jilma uh, Rousseff, and um, then the uh, summit in, in Cartagena. But that said, he doesn't really have uh, a very deep um, uh, cadre of uh, Latin American hands that uh, he can, uh, outside of the the uh, um, career and the uh, um, named officials that he has to, to work in, in the region. Um, President Clinton had Mac McCarty, McLarty. Uh, President Reagan had uh, a number of people uh, over the years uh, that uh, uh, worked for him uh, that were sort of semi-official uh, ambassadors. Um, George Bush had his brother Jeb, but mm -hmm. uh, we don't see, you know, a, uh, a number of people that uh, might be able to do that uh, for President Obama. So he is spread uh, uh, fairly thin. And with this region in particular, you find that uh, um, at least success in, in building agreements and, and finding common ground uh, relies a great deal on contact and, and being able to talk to people uh, quite a bit. And, and maybe that's a little bit more so than other areas of the world uh, where relationships can be a little more institutional. But contact, personal contact, means means a lot uh, in the Americas, and there hasn't been a lot of time to be able to to, to build up that uh, that sense of goodwill. Has it hurt him? I think the jury's uh, still out on that. Um, certainly, uh, there are a number of things that uh, have helped U.S. relationships. But uh, again, you know, we're living in different times. Uh, we're living in times when. Uh, Many countries have graduated into middle income status. Uh, um, they're asserting leadership on their own. They're becoming regional leaders and they're, be they're gaining roles in, in the international arena, which sets up a, a very different uh, dynamic. And certainly you see that with uh, Brazil, with Colombia, Chile, Mexico, uh, Peru to some extent. Um, and uh, those countries that are contributing uh, to the international community, and that's, you know, a very different uh, uh, thing. So the United States doesn't have that sort of lead role that it used to have. Uh, now one thing in the military uh, area that we always uh, used to talk about was building partnership capacity, and that's been uh, a mantra for the last uh, 10 years. But in all areas, in economics, in politics, and, and uh, security, um, there's been an effort by U.S. diplomats to build partnership capacity. And when this happens, um, then the relationships change a little bit because all of a sudden these countries are more uh, in a collegial status than they are in a supplicant status. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a very different ball game. Yeah, Julie, then we'll come down here. Hi, I'm Julie Pace from the Associated Press. Um, I had two quick questions. One on drug legalization. Um, I was wondering if you could characterize where the discussions on drug legalization stand, particularly in Colombia and Mexico, and what the prospects of that moving forward are, um, especially if there's no U.S. backing for it. And then second on Iran. Uh, Iran obviously has uh, tried to build relationships with countries in Latin America, and I was wondering if you could talk about how that uh, that dynamic might impact the dynamic between some of the Latin American countries and the U.S., and whether you thought Obama might try to raise the Iran issue with any of the leaders he meets in the summit. Steve, it sounds like she read your report. <laughs> oh, okay, well, I'll just refer you to the report. Next question. <laughs> this isn't the White House briefing room. <laughs> I have nothing for you on that. <laughs> um, Julie, you know, those are, those are good questions. The drug legalization, um, I, I think in some uh, aspects uh, that has been overblown a little bit because uh, what that is, and it was really started by Guatemala's president, uh, uh, President uh, uh, Perez Molina, 
and uh, I think uh, out of a sense of frustration due to the high cost of uh, doing drug interdiction and also uh, dealing with the uh, attendant violence that accompanies uh, narcotics trafficking, um, trying to seek uh, a different solution that would uh, relieve the state of having such a, a huge burden. And if you look at Guatemala, which has about a, a $40 billion, and, and I think I'm right on this, mm -hmm. uh, about a $40 billion gross domestic yeah, product. That's probably about right. And if you look at this in, in economic terms, um, if you're facing a global industry that's got a $400 $400 billion uh, uh, income globally, and, and they have the, the uh, luxury of being able to steal or to even buy airplanes for one-time use, I've said this over and over again, and then fly them in and crash land them and, and then transport their, their product uh, to market uh, over land and over sea and that kind of thing. Um, and you're having trouble buying one or two helicopters yourself. Uh, you're really up against a a difficult situation. So you've got to appreciate that, especially with the small Central American countries. They don't look at Belize, population of 370,000 people. How are they going to pay that bill to be able to be a, a big actor uh, on that? And so I think they're looking for a little uh, economic relief, uh, which is which is part of this. But I don't think in, in any case that it's gone to the point where they're saying that we've got to legalized drugs or we've got to decriminalize drugs uh, either in Mexico or, or Colombia. What I think they're saying is that we need to have a talk. We need to have a, a dialogue on this and, and to see if maybe there's not uh, a better way uh, to be able to, to deal with this. And then on Iran, um, if you look at to the sum of Iran's relationships uh, over the last decade, certainly they have picked up uh, in this region although they're not um, unusual in that Iran has had uh, relationships in the Americas that go back for more than a, a century. And a lot of them are based on oil diplomacy with OPEC. Uh, and in addition to that, also a concern, even in the Shah's time, for uh, developing uh, nations. And, and uh, this, uh, the Islamic Republic is still playing that card. Uh, very much uh, trying to do that very much uh, to its own advantage. And it's added to that a page out of the, the United States uh, public diplomacy playbook in, in the, during the Cold War uh, in that it is trying to develop a strategic communications component with international broadcasting and websites and, and uh, content to development uh, uh, for uh, media that it can exploit in countries that are friendly to it. But in looking over the, the, the whole range of uh, joint ventures and things that Iran is doing, it's really questionable as to how much it's actually getting out of uh, its relations with uh, certain countries, the ALBA countries, for instance, in, in Latin America. And the two really big players, Argentina and Brazil, are really institutional, and they're more interested in selling grain, beef, uh, uh, commodities to Iran than they are in, in any kind of a, a strategic uh, uh, relationship. In Argentina's case, it's got um, Argentina's I uh, interested in, in resolving what happened with the uh, um, Israeli embassy and the Jewish community center bombings. In Brazil's case, um, quite frankly, uh, uh, a self-invite by President Ahmadinejad just recently uh, was uh, turned down. So what kind of a signal does that Send. Um, I think that one thing that the United States could do is take advantage of the fact that there are some countries that are very friendly to us that have relationships with Iran and that we should be talking with them to gain insights into uh, what's going on in Iran and, and uh, um, who's really doing the talking and, and, and uh, um, what the, the state of the, the power play in that government might be. Yeah, down here, and then we'll go down to Dan. Thanks. Um, I'm Laura McGinnis from Rogers. I w continuing on the theme of drugs and security, I wondered how much pressure Obama is likely to face to do more to confront the violence um, and 
trafficking that's happening in Central America, you know, after the U.S. having been so so involved in Colombia and sort of successfully addressing the problem there, um, it's been described often as a sort of a spillover of sort of the trouble moving as a result of that and the U.S. not doing anything in response. I, I just wondered how, how big of a theme that's going to be this weekend. Well, one of the things that you have to face, Laura, is, is that uh, um, in the trafficking areas, in, in the areas where the actual trafficking is taking place near the borders and things like that, it's actually very peaceful. It's the, where the violence is, is in the cities where there's our turf wars going on between rival organizations. And that's, that's the, the real problem. So um, you could say, well, drug, better drug interdiction and uh, um, uh, reduction of demand and, and also treatment would be helpful. And, and that may have um, some degree of, of, uh, of effect on the, the overall problem. But really, the, the nub of the issue on, on violence is uh, um, building uh, an institutional capacity into law enforcement, police reform, and also uh, the criminal justice system. And these are still rudimentary reforms in most countries. They're all different. In, in each country, the, the mix of the problems, uh, you know, the sub-problems is, uh, is completely different. So you couldn't just say that it's one answer would, would fit all. But generally, it's those two areas in policing and, and law enforcement and also providing economic op opportunity for people so that they'll choose something other than a life of crime uh, for a way to uh, survive and, and to make a living. Um, sorry. Um, but how much pressure is President Obama likely to face in terms of the U.S. engagement on that theme in Central America and Mexico? Well, he's probably going to give some pressure himself because uh, uh, in terms of law enforcement and police reform, those are two things that those countries um, themselves have, have got to uh, confront. And, and in Mexico's case, uh, my sense is that um, many in Mexico and the Mexican public are still in denial that they have a problem with their judicial uh, uh, criminal systems and, and also their, their law enforcement. Uh, that still have a ways to go to, to overcome years of uh, neglect. Um, and, and certainly Mexico's doing a lot right now, but it, it's, it's a long road ahead. But the other thing, though, in terms of pressure on the United States is that uh, there will be pressure uh, to help pay for some of these reforms and also pay for equipping um, police and, uh, in some cases, the military in drug interdiction and doing certain kinds of things that offer better territorial uh, protection um, to build up sort of uh, rural gendarmes, uh, rural uh, security forces uh, where some of this, uh, uh, where some of the connections are on drugs. And then, of course, in the cities. But it all takes uh, some money and with limited gross domestic products. And then if you've got uh, historically low uh, uh, taxation uh, collection, tax collection rates. Um, the governments themselves are, are, are cash strapped, which means they've got to do a better job of collecting their taxes, but uh, uh, also uh, big ticket items. Um, donors like the Inter-American Development Bank, others, the United States uh, will play a role in, in buying some of that stuff if we think that's important to us. Yeah, Dan. Um, so we had the uh, we had the drama three years ago with the handshake with President Chavez. Um, haven't checked at, as of a few days ago. I thought he was still going to show up uh, at, at the summit. What? Where does he his influence stand in the region at this point? What what impact do you think he has? Has been has that been compartmentalized to the specific group to the Alba group? What? Where does all that stand? Here? To, um, <laughs> here, this one works. Go 
Hugo Chavez is going to command the lime, limelight uh, uh, no matter where he is or what, what state he's in. I don't think we really have a very good idea what uh, uh, his health condition is because uh, we're, we're relying on, on, on third, third party information for most of that and then what he says. So we don't know. Uh, but uh, he's certainly a gifted uh, thespian and uh, he will make the most of every opportunity to uh, um, make his influence. Uh, felt and certainly at, at uh, this summit uh, where he's recommended that members of the Alba countries at, mm -hmm. attend uh, I'm sure that he will uh, try uh, to do that And I've been to the region a couple times recently and I, I do get the sense that there's been a, a compartmentalization of his influence uh, <clears throat> I think partially because <clears throat> the, uh, some of its Certainly the resources are nice, but the policy advice that goes with it oftentimes is perceived as screwball, I guess is, that's the think tank <laughs> term for it, so stop there. Right here, and then we'll come back on, on this side. Well, my name is Gregorio Meraz. I'm correspondent for Television News Network. For a long time, uh, you as using the certification process have been putting pressure on the Latin American countries to force them to eradicate the drug production and the traffic, etc. Uh, now too many countries believe that uh, there was a kind of hypocrisy because uh, maybe the main problem of the, of the drugs is the unstoppable, unstoppable appetite for drugs in the U.S. Do you think President Obama is going to face uh, a sort of uh, demand to do something clear and uh, strong to reduce the appetite of drugs first, to stop the smuggle of weapons to Mexico that are empowering the cartels, to, to provide more assistance to Mexico and the Latin American countries in a way maybe similar to what uh, have done with Colombia? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I, I think the, the impression is still that the United States is the major market for this. Actually, the, the uh, uh, use of uh, hard narcotics in the United States has been declining slightly and, and has really plateaued uh, in the last few years. It's still not uh, to say that uh, uh, it's not a significant amount of uh, 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 drug flow that comes into this country. But at the same time, a number of other countries are starting to complain about the amount of drugs that are coming into their countries and, and not just for transshipment to other parts of the world, but also to satisfy growing local uh, markets and, and consumption. Uh, Argentina comes to mind. It's got radars uh, up near the Bolivian border in, in its uh, Escudo del Norte, the, the Northern Shield program that has gotten started. Uh, Chile has... Uh, uh, plussed up its uh, presence on its northern border and uh, is worried about uh, growing consumption uh, as well as uh, becoming a transshipment point to, for the Pacific uh, into faraway places like New Zealand and, and Australia. Um, so uh, um, it's not a problem that's uh, necessarily localized to the United States mm -hmm. and just to the north. Um, it goes uh, south and then it goes east and, and west uh, from there. Um, and um, I think there's some worry about what uh, the long-term future uh, for that will be. Do you think uh, Mexico will put uh, more pressure, as has been doing President Calderon, to force somehow the White House to compromise in stopping the flow of weapons to Mexico? Well, that's a... Uh, constitutional issue for the United States, and it's uh, not something that's uh, um, easily regulated. But uh, certainly there will be pressure to uh, regulate to, to some degree, to a better degree, uh, um, gun sales um, so that uh, there is at least some reduction across the border. But again, the problem with that is, is that guns are kind of like oil. They're fungible in that that if the United States, uh, uh, if people aren't able to come to the United States and buy them and transport them over the border, they're certainly able to get them anywhere else in the world. So um, it wouldn't make 
really very much difference for Mexico. It's a problem that they will have to deal with themselves. And if you allow me just one more thing, you say that the Mexican government have been doing some things but not enough. Who do you think is neglecting and refusing to accept that uh, the problem is bigger and requires uh, a stronger demand, uh, a stronger uh, reforms? Up to now, most of the efforts have been made at the, the national level in Mexico, and that's the easiest uh, one to tackle. But the hardest uh, level to tackle are the state and the municipal levels, um, where reforms are harder to uh, enact, uh, the budgets are smaller, and uh, the police pay is typically a lot lower. And uh, low pay is, is one of the, the major problems uh, in reforming uh, and uh, improving uh, the performance of uh, police. When you're only making 200 to $250 a month, it's uh, real tough to uh, look the other way when somebody offers you a bribe, and that's, that's part of the problem. Also the state and the local courts. The United States has a very similar uh, structure in terms of its uh, federal system, um, but in Mexico's case, that federal system had been, at least at the state and municipal uh, levels have been neglected uh, for many years. I think we'll take a, a last round of questions. We'll take them all. I'll, I'll keep tally and we'll, uh, we'll let these guys sort of wrap up. So let's go here and then Scott, and then if you could make your way to a microphone, we'll do that. Hi, Amy Chewy with BNA. I wanted to ask about uh, Colombia. You had mentioned that there was some resentment because it took so long in terms of the free trade agreement. I wondered what kind of interaction there might be between President Obama and his, his Colombian counterpart. And also I wanted to ask in terms of the Trans-Pacific Partnership if there's going to be any reaction. And, and I believe Meredith mentioned something about uh, interest in Colombia in joining an agreement, and I kind of wanted to hear a bit more about that. Thank you. Scott, let's, let's take a round. Uh, Dan, I wonder if you could just elaborate a little bit on what is jeopardizing Argentina in the, in the uh, G20. Sir? Yeah, I had a quick question. Um, with the uh, strong economies you talked about in Central and South America, is the United States doing as much as they possibly can to take advantage of that? Okay, that was a good round. So, uh, you want to take Meredith? You want to take the FTA TPP piece? Dan, maybe Argentina, and can end up with Steve on the central side. Yeah, I mean, I think the the issue of Colombia and TPP is a little premature in the sense that they've got to implement the <coughs> existing free trade agreement, the bilateral with the U.S. Um, so, I'm not sure that that will particularly be a discussion of this meeting. I think folks that are interested in supporting an active trade agenda, I think Colombia would be a great candidate to join the TPP as soon as it's, it, it feels like it's willing to do so and interested. So I think there'll be a lot of folks in the business community in the United States and so forth that will be um, enthusiastic about that prospect. But it is a little bit premature because the FTA still has to be implemented. Colombia needs to put in some laws and regulations and kind of get get the, the FTA up and running now that it's been passed by both governments. Okay, I mean, I'm take the Argentina one. I think the first is there's this reference to this WTO situation. I think that's, that's the first point. I think the second is they've been lying on their prices for about six or seven years in terms of their inflation rate. The Economist has <clears throat> actually um, – gotten rid of the official uh, statistics of the country of Argentina. I think it's, I don't know if there are any other countries where they do this, and they use a, an alternative uh, system to, to track uh, prices. Uh, so nobody, nobody takes their official numbers seriously. And then the third is that they're not recognizing their contractual obligations um, on a number of judicial, uh, uh, there have been, been, in essence, adjudicated uh, conflicts uh, within the, the World Bank group. There's something called the ICSID. Uh, don't ask me to tell you what ICSID stands for. I know what it's called in Spanish, it's called CIADI, but I couldn't tell you what it, but it's basically an, uh, as part of agreements when you, uh, as part of, uh, uh, but, but basically the Argentines have had a number of claims go against them and they've refused to recognize them. And so you've got 
a, a trade problem, you've got this ICSID problem, and you've got a, a lying on uh, st price statistics problem, just, just, to, as, just for starters. So uh, on the issue of, uh, of Colombia, my assumption is, is this is a showcase opportunity for President Santos. And so I think that uh, uh, I think it's in both countries' interests to, uh, to, uh, to put the best, to, to have a, put the best face on, on what I think was, was an unfortunate five-year delay, which was way too long for that, for that trade agreement. On economics, on uh, the, the economic uh, prosperity that's uh, been evident in uh, Central and South America, of course, uh, it's a little more spotty in Central America. Um, the, these economies being small and, and also being impacted by uh, the uh, violence and, and, and drug trafficking in the area. But South America has, has been rather impressive in the, in the past uh, five to six years. Is the United States taking advantage of this? Well, how might the United States do that? Um, obviously, in the growth of trade, that's uh, uh, one area that uh, the United States has been able to do that. And in the sort of uh, going by the philosophy that uh, a rising tide lifts all boats, um, I think the United States has been quite correct in, in pursuing policies of, of freer markets, a uh, rule of law, uh, to uh, help neighbors become more prosperous because if, in fact, the, um, Latin America is the number four trading partner of the United States, then that means that um, its prosperity will enable it to buy more uh, U.S. exports. Uh, I think in terms of being able to do better, though, that uh, some of those aspects of, uh, of uh, rule of law, such as institutionalization of uh, criminal proceedings, uh, uh, de developing uh, more capacity in, in judicial institutions, those things are uh, um, reforms that have only gone about halfway. And if they go further, and if the United States is able to push that further, it'll have an economic benefit of making uh, those markets uh, uh, freer. And the benefit, of course, uh, is that it will enable uh, small uh, enterprises to start up quicker and, and easier, uh, and that will boost the number of jobs, and, and that eventually will affect the Gini coefficient. And uh, so that will reduce some of the, the uh, social inequality. Those are all positive things that can come from pressing rule of law uh, reforms. Folks, thanks again for coming. Uh, please let me or Andrew know if we can help you get a hold of these experts or any others as the summit is going on. Uh, like I said, North Korea, let us know. Victor's around. I uh, hope to see some of you at GSF on Wednesday. Take care.